extraordinary individuals whose lives told a story about the past that was a story for our own time. It's a story that contributes to an urgent conversation on race. It recovers a forgotten strand of visionary feminism that linked women's issues to those of economic justice and race. It lifts up the role of the social gospel in Southern movements for social justice, making clear that Christian faith and practice has not always been, it does not have to be uh, associated with the right. And because these sisters were so powerfully affected by McCarthyism, which in, in different ways derailed Grace's and Catherine's uh, lives and the movements in which they were involved, because of that, their story reminds us of the necessity of courage and persistence in the face of history's tragic reversals. So I want to uh, shift now and just give you a, a little visual sense of the people and the places that I wrote about. So here's where it began uh, with me interviewing Catherine uh, at a time when my career was just beginning and she was in the last uh, decade of her life. I think our body language speaks volumes. She's gracious, she's supportive, but she keeps her own counsel and says only what she wants to say. William Lumpkin, the sister's father, grew up in this plantation house in Georgia where his parents and grandparents lived before him. At uh, the age of 15, he marched off to fight in the Civil War. He saturated his children with stories about this house and about the slave South in general, which he portrayed as uh, a lost paradise, a time of beauty and abundance in which kindly slave owners took care of loyal slaves. Later on, all three of the sisters came to understand that the white columned mansion that they pictured was a fantasy. And more important, Catherine and Grace came to understand the self-deluding nature of their father's stories and the enormity of what it actually meant to own and have almost unlimited power over other human beings. Raised to expect to wield such power, William was instead reduced to working for the railroad after the war. At the turn of the 19th century, he was transferred here to Columbia, and he struggled in this new state to regain the status that he felt that he had lost by reinventing himself as a colonel in the United Confederate Veterans. He had been a lowly private who had just barely fought in the Civil War, but he was a colonel in the United Confederate Veterans. He deployed his children, all of his children, as foot soldiers in the 19th century movement to commemorate the lost cause which uh, stamped the landscape of the South with the Confederate monuments that are at the center of so much controversy today. He taught them that their mission in life was to uphold the ideals uh, that those uh, monuments stood for. And uh, they had no doubt that white supremacy stood at the core of those ideals. The South might have lost the Civil War, but as long as whites ruled over blacks, its cause had not been lost. Annette Lumpkin, the sister's mother, was overshadowed by her husband, yet she played a major role in influence her rebellious daughters. She had taught school before marrying, and her learning and beauty were, as Catherine put it, proud family possessions. Her love of reading was one of the things that made all three of the sisters want to write. 
And when Catherine and Grace plunged into their unconventional lives, she tried to protect them from the disapproval of the men in the family and gave them her implicit support. Elizabeth may have been the most conventional of the sisters, but she pushed at gender boundaries in her own way. Here she is at the height of her uh, career as a speaker at veterans reunions where she perfected the art of oratory which was traditionally the province of men. She made her debut before an audience of thousands here in Columbia in 1901 according to the Columbia newspapers. Her ringing carrying voice struck all the right notes the importance of, quote, racial purity, the urgency of securing books for the public library that do full and complete justice to the Confederate soldier. I love you was her signature closing line. You grand old men who guarded with your lives the virgin whiteness of our state. We daughters can only envy the honor our lovely mothers gloried in they could love and marry Confederate soldiers. We can only work for them with tireless fingers run with tireless feet. Now, over the next few years after this debut, Elizabeth was inundated with invitations to speak at veterans events. Her father uh, served as her stage manager he suggested what she should talk about. He tried to make sure her speeches were covered in the newspapers. He traveled with her throughout the South. Now, all of this makes Elizabeth sound, uh, from through present day eyes, a little silly, a little bit like her father's puppet, but she was far from being that. She had ambitions of her own. She studied oratory at, in college and in New York and Boston. She wanted to be an actress and she did uh, parlay her skills into a position as a professor of oratory at Winthrop College. Her career was cut short when she married because you were not allowed to have a career and a family. Um, here is her um, lavish Confederate wedding and held here in 1905. Uh, it's modeled on a fan fantasy of what upper class weddings were like before the Civil War. That's Catherine in the bottom uh, left corner kind of leaning in and Grace who's a bridesmaid is to Elizabeth's right and here is Elizabeth with her husband her mother and her four children in Asheville uh, where her husband was a prominent doctor as a wife and mother she uh, among many other things led in civic improvement efforts within the bounds of segregation here is Asheville's, hmm, here is Asheville's uh, grand public library, which she had a big hand in founding. It was for whites only. And this is the belated and obviously much inferior colored library, which she also supported, which was something that her, neither her mother nor her younger sisters would have done, although for opposite reasons. Uh, after her uh, husband drank himself to death, which he did rather famously because he was the model for a character in Thomas Wolfe's novels, um, she uh, became one of the first women in North Carolina to read for the law, to hang out her shingle as a lawyer. Throughout all this, she continued to uh, devote herself to keeping the loss, the memory of the lost cause alive. These are the aging veterans who met at her house every year uh, for a grand uh, luncheon. In her 80s, 
she went back to school, studied creative writing, and wrote a historical novel, which she came very uh, close to publishing. Um, it was a novel about slavery, which painted the slave owners as we would expect in a golden light. All three of the sisters went to what is Brunel, now Brunel University. This is uh, the crow's nest on the Brunel campus, the site of one of the uh, beloved uh, rituals, student rituals, both then and now. These are the seniors, the, only the seniors can uh, have the use of the crow's nest, and here they are in their, this is in uh, Catherine's senior year, and the seniors are there in their caps and gowns about to turn over the crow's nest to the rising class. And here is the crow's nest today with me checking it out, uh, still following in the Lumpkin's footsteps to the last possible second. Um, this was uh, giving a, a talk at Brunel, which was a, a, a lot of fun. So it was at Brunel that uh, Grace and Catherine encountered the social gospel, the social sciences, and the far-sighted women of the YWCA. An organization that I think played a much bigger role in the civil rights movement and in women's history than most people realize. When I started doing research, Brunel had basically no archives, but I uh, rummaged through old file cabinets in the alumni office uh, where the yearbooks and such were kept and uh, was uh, blown away by the vibrancy of the undergraduate culture that I discovered in those sources. Um, central to that culture were romantic friendships between women. This was a craze in uh, women's colleges in the Northeast. I knew about that, but I didn't know that this was also the case in Southern women's colleges. At Brunel, those relationships went by the name of love casing. And Catherine, who was a student leader devoted to the ecumenical, inclusive, um, ideals of the YWCA was also, according to the yearbooks, the school's champion love caser, organizing uh, all girl dances like this one, uh, it's a Valentine's dance, and uh, wooing, winning, and deserting a changing cast of girls. Looking in depth at these student years helped me come to grips with a challenge that I faced and that I think any historian uh, faces. Uh, and that is how to write about same-sex partnerships in ways that uh, avoid uh, applying reductive labels to these partnerships that the uh, women themselves would not have used. On the one hand, or, on the other hand, uh, reinforcing what one historian calls the historical denial of lesbianism, which, by which she means <coughs> refusing to recognize women's romantic relationships for what they are. So it was by, um, in uh, looking closely at these early years that I began to uh, understand where uh, Catherine's uh, passions and commitments came from and how they developed over time. After graduating from college, Catherine went north to study, um, this is her as in, the, in her 20s, to study at Columbia University and the YWCA training school. In 1920, she returned to the South on what was at that time a daring mission, working in partnership with black women uh, to build an interracial uh, student movement. The key site for bringing uh, blacks and whites together was a conference center in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Uh, here's Catherine with her colleagues at Blue Ridge. And here is uh, the Brunel delegation on the steps of Robert E. Lee Hall. 
Uh, the problem that they faced, so this was uh, one of the few places in the South where blacks and whites could meet together, where blacks could speak to white audiences and so on. The problem was that it was owned by the YWCA's male counterpart, the Young Men's Christian Association, which required that black uh, students and uh, speakers uh, eat and sleep in segregated colleges. Juliet Derricot and uh, Frances Williams were Catherine's key black uh, partners in the interracial movement, and it was their refusal to submit to those conditions that prompted the Y to quit holding its summer conferences in Blue Ridge and to take a more and more public stance against all forms of segregation. Uh, putting it out in front of most predominantly white women's organizations of the time. Here is uh, the amazing Frances Williams, who was uh, Catherine's, uh, the co-director with Catherine of the student, Southern Student YWCA. Grace Lumpkin followed Elizabeth's example as a lost cause orator. Here she is at 14, um, at the height of her girl orator career. Um, but like Catherine, she had eye-opening experiences during the years in and around World War I. Most uh, chief among these was the opportunity to go to France as an emissary of the YWCA uh, during, uh, during the war. Most of the women who went abroad during this period went as nurses or canteen workers, and their job was to support the soldiers. But the wise emissaries went to support women. Both uh, French war workers, the women who were, had been pulled into uh, munitions factories, and the uh, U.S. women war workers. In 1924, Grace made her break for New York, where she was soon uh, ensconced in the far reaches of Bohemia and left-wing politics. Here she is in the Lower East Side apartment she shared with her roommate and best friend, and then uh, later with, with her uh, lover and husband and later husband. By 1932, she had published her best and still in print and still relevant novel, To Make My Bread, about the legendary Gastonia strike of 1929. Um, she uh, had also, um, Oh, I've lost a page here. She had published this. She had published her 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 her, her she had published her novel, but she was uh, poor as a church mouse, and um, she to make money, she published a couple of pot boilers, which uh, aren't much uh, as novels but which are very revealing about the inner turmoil that she was experiencing even as early as the 1930s. Turmoil over the contradictions that she faced, uh, the contradictions in Bohemian culture between free love and male privilege, uh, between her success and her family's disapproval, between her ambitions and her, as a writer, and the New York and male-centric atmosphere in which she labored. By the 1930s, Catherine was ensconced in an uh, equally radical but very different life. She had found her life partner, Dorothy Douglas, pictured here, uh, an outspoken left-leaning economist at Smith College, and together they plunged into the struggle to make the New Deal as inclusive as the social democratic European countries 
they admired. They traveled to Mexico and the Soviet Union to see revolutions in progress in the 1940s when Dorothy uh, inherited a small fortune from her parents, they transformed a mansion in Northampton, Massachusetts into a combination of salon, political hub, and uh, communal living space for struggling World War II refugees and local friends. Grace and Catherine's distinct but parallel lives collided in the 1950s when they reacted to McCarthyism in diametrically opposed ways. As the unredacted um, FBI reports and other sources revealed, Grace actively sought out a role as an anti-communist government informant, willingly named names, accusing both Dorothy and Catherine of belonging to the Communist Party or being close to it, which by now Grace equated with being traitors dedicated to the violent overthrow of the government. In part because of Grace's accusations, Dorothy was called before the House Un-American Activities Committee and found herself facing the same dilemma confronted by other uh, victims of the Red Scare. If she testified, she could be forced to inform on her friends and colleagues. If she pled the Fifth Amendment, refusing to testify on the grounds that she might incriminate herself, she would be condemned in the court of public opinion, or worse. She pled the fifth, but demanded to read a statement explaining her reasons for doing so. The committee refused to let her speak, but here she is on the steps of the Capitol, waving a prepared statement. Um, ex, uh, and uh, read what she read to reporters. She, uh, as she explained in the statement, she had been prepared to answer all questions pertaining to the period before her divorce from her husband, Paul Douglas, who was by then a very uh, important, powerful liberal senator, uh, because she knew that refusing to do so would damage his career, would be used against him by his enemies but she would plead the fifth regarding her personal political beliefs uh, in, and associations in later years after she was on her own. And uh, here's what she said. The sole purpose of such inquiry would be to determine whether my political beliefs conform to those of this committee. Such inquisition can result only in the suppression of freedom of conscience and of the mind. Few would dare to maintain an unpopular opinion or support an unpopular cause if that opinion or support can be the subject of public inquiry and penalty. So, um, going to uh, shift gears here again and sort of go back to the beginning and uh, just read a little bit from the uh, chapter on uh, Catherine's writing of, of her 1946 autobiography. And the book that has been my lodestar as I uh, wrote my own book. So this is uh, Catherine at the point uh, when she wrote The Making of a Southerner. This is uh, her, her as a child. This is the picture that she chose for the, co the cover of the paperback version of her book. And I think this photograph is, is very evocative and I'll just read a little paragraph. This is a paragraph that starts the book, my book. Uh, she seems incandescent from her cloud of blonde hair to her long lacy dress. Weeds brush her feet, 
Her hands rest on the edge of a huge wooden barrel half filled with dead leaves. Swaddled in whiteness, yet confined by a dark spiky fence, she is a daughter of the Old South, but there is no remnant here of the treasured plantation past, not a jasmine or a magnolia in sight. She glances to her right with a doubtful, questioning expression. She is poised to step out of the frame. So um, this is, uh, I, I think we, are we try, aiming for uh, to end at right at six o'clock? If so, I can. You should carry on. I, I'll, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll cut this. I'll cut this a little bit short, but I, I want to read just a little bit more uh, from her autobiography. The, uh, the from the chapter about her autobiography. The impulse to write about the self and the South. Uh, drew energy from outsiders' desire to know about the region, just a minute, yeah, um, and white Southerners' compulsion to explain. Beginning after World War I, both regional apologists and homegrown critics told about the South, sometimes in fond or defensive remembrance, sometimes in mild, uneasy critique, sometimes in guilt anguish and anger, and often in an unsettling mix of all three. But for all their differences, one remarkable omission tied these writings together. None took up the challenge of confronting the author's complicity with the, cat, the South's caste system by using her own life to, quote, trace to its source the complex development of racial attitudes in a caste society, Catherine propelled Southern auto, white autobiography in a new direction. The making of a Southerner became the first in a long line of self-writing in which white men and women sought to use their own lives to show how each generation of children is inducted into the culture of white supremacy and how they can free themselves from its coils. Catherine devotes the first third of her book to the deep background of her childhood and the myths and secondhand memories with which she was imbued. In the last two thirds, she weaves a narrative of remaking around a series of carefully chosen turning points in which she confronts what she calls the South's clashing incongruities and gradually unlearns the lessons she had internalized as a child. So this is, uh, I'm going to end here with uh, her account of the first of these pivotal moments. She's eight years old and living with her family in the small town of Ridgeway, uh, strolling, quote, aimlessly out into the yard before breakfast. She looks through a window and sees a terrible sight. Her father is beating the family's cook. Sounds, sights, and sensations fairly leap off the page. I could see, I could hear, she repeats over and over, describing the screaming, writhing woman, the man's face distorted by rage, the quote, blows of a descending stick. Catherine does not call this violent man father, the term she uses for William throughout the book. Yet she leaves no doubt about the identity of what she does call the white master who delivers, quote, blow upon blow. She chose those words carefully, evoking the lash of slavery and the terror of reconstruction and witnessing not only to this one act, but also to the countless crimes committed by anonymous white men against anonymous black women. She thus transforms the personal into the political, a disturbing, confusing childhood memory into an allegory of white male impunity and privilege. Um, I go on then in the book to talk about how she reacts to that event and how it opens the first, her first doubts in the uh, uh, worldview that, in which she had been trained.
in spite of these dark undercurrents in this autobiography, The Making of a Southerner is, as one reviewer put it, a book of hope. It was published in the wake of World War II. We had just won a war against fascism. Blacks had made tremendous progress fighting a double B campaign against fascism abroad and racism at home. The labor movement had penetrated the South. A new progressive interracial coalition had formed in the region. And in this hopeful atmosphere, Catherine was convinced that changing the hearts and minds of white Southerners was both possible and uh, necessary. By describing her upbringing, she sought to identify herself with these readers, taking them step by step through her own transformation in order to deepen and clarify the aroused thinking in which she believed they were already engaged. Her writing embodied a promise a ch that change can occur from within. She put it this way. To all appearances, the South was a highly fixed, stable environment, frozen in its ways. But this same South could and did refashion some of its children. Some of us, although molded in the image of a bygone day, yet found the South itself so dynamic, so replete with clashing incongruities, that these could start us down the road to change. Thank you. Thank you. What, a, what a fascinating and, and in many ways such a dark story, but it is just fascinating. I can't wait to read the book. And in so many ways, the way you described how you wrote the book is worthy of a book. And so thank you so much for coming. And let, let me say that Dr. Hall will be Bill. No. <laughs> oh, where the books are. That makes sense. Dr. Hall will be um, in that corner of the room, and she will be signing copies of her book. Um, thank you again so much for coming. And let me remind all of you that there is a reception right outside of this room, and we hope you can join us for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Hall.